Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School. Let's stand and sing number 59. My faith looks up to thee, number 59 in your hymn book. Sunday school and a word of prayer. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Sauna this morning, and uh, we're going to help you lose weight today by sweating it out, and uh, praise the Lord we can gather together and uh, be here on this day, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, the next uh, couple of weeks and what the Lord has for us, excited about our uh, Canada Day picnic on Saturday, and of course uh, our anniversary Sunday just two weeks away, uh, but I'm excited about what the Lord has for us today. And uh, good for us to be out together. Of course, many uh, still on their way to be with us this morning, but we're glad you're here. And uh, we'll have one more congregational song, and uh, then we'll start our Sunday schools this morning. Brother Colton, come lead us in one more song. Number 111, Lead Me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crown brown, lead me to Calvary, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony. Thou slept. 
I forget thy agony. Take your Bibles and turn to Exodus 31 this morning, if you would. Exodus chapter 31. Teenagers, get out of here. We'll going to dismiss our teenagers this morning for a teen class. And if you don't have one of our uh, one of your lessons, there is a few left back there on the back. Uh, back table, lesson five, we're going to conclude today uh, the journey to Sinai, uh, and that's Exodus 31, we're beginning here this morning, and we're going to look at uh, passages here from Exodus 31 into uh, chapter 32, uh, just a, a little ways here, but let's start with verse 18. Exodus 31, verse 18, and then we will uh, have a word of prayer and begin our uh, study this morning. The Bible says, and he, gave, and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we have the very word of God today. Lord, how special and how wonderful that Moses received it. But Lord, it was not a blessing for Moses alone. Lord, we open your perfect word today just as holy and pure as it was the day you gave to Moses several thousand years ago. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us as we are encouraged about our walk of faith, about our life of faith as believers. Lord, I pray you'd use this passage and these truths to challenge us, Lord, to get us to walk out of the comfortable, to get us to walk into your purpose, your plan uh, for our life. Uh, bless us now in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Follow along with me in verse chapter 32 and verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said to him up make us gods which shall go before us for as for this Moses the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt we wot not what has become of him and Aaron said unto them break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them unto me and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord. And they rose up early in the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Skip down to verse 30. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. We began a few weeks ago looking at this journey 
this journey of faith, uh, this journey to Sinai, and let me repeat again, and I know I've repeated this several times, but I want to make sure we, we understand here. When we talk about a journey of faith, I'm not talking about a journey to faith in Christ. Understand that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a matter of believing the gospel. Uh, there is nothing to work up. There's nothing to build up. There's no steps to climb. Uh, it is simply uh, by grace through faith. That is salvation. When we talk about a journey of faith, we're talking about uh, for us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have accepted the gospel. Uh, God has a walk of faith for us in our life, not a walk to get to heaven, not a walk to earn or uh, to deserve salvation, but a walk with him in faith because we are the children of God. And, and as we look here, we uh, talked about, uh, a couple weeks ago, talked about Cora Ten Boone, uh, talked about her and her family uh, and how they went through such a horrible atrocity uh, many years ago, of course, in concentration camp. And uh, no doubt, whenever they arrived there uh, in that horrible time in history, I'm sure they prayed, Oh God, get me out of here. Oh God, remove me from this place. Oh God, uh, give me victory out of this place. But God did not immediately remove them. Rather, there was a walk of faith as they waited on the Lord, and God would use Miss Ten Boone uh, powerfully uh, to share her faith in her latter years as she waited on the Lord. We have a picture here in Exodus of God's people getting tired of waiting on the Lord. Now, it was not the Lord they were speaking of. They were speaking of Moses, but understand, Moses was the man that God had given them as leadership, and they said, we don't know where Moses is. He's probably dead. We're not waiting any longer. So often in our walk of faith, we get anxious. We doubt God. We want to get ahead of God. We, we don't want to follow his purpose and his will. And we see that God had a purpose for his people. Now, God's mighty hand is revealed very powerfully in the book of Egypt. God did the, wrought the mighty plagues in Egypt. Eventually, the, uh, the death angel would pass over the land. Uh, God would send them out, uh, preserve them out of the land of Egypt. They would come to the Red Sea. Uh, God would part the Red Sea. God would take them through the Red Sea. And uh, I remember uh, many years ago, I took a young fellow hunting, and uh, he shot a porcupine, and he called his mom. And uh, he said, you're not going to believe what I'm eating. And she's, he's, I heard her say, you're with Pastor Rice. It could be anything. And uh, she's, he said, I'm eating porcupine. And there was dead silence on the phone. And, uh, and she said, what does it taste like? And I whispered to the young fellow. I said, tell her it tastes like bald eagle. And uh, he said, Pastor says it tastes like bald eagle. There was dead silence on the phone again. Uh, no, I haven't eaten bald eagle. Uh, and I also have not eaten Leviathan, but God's people did. And uh, God fed them uh, as they crossed the Red Sea. God provided for them. The mighty hand of God revealed. And Moses goes to talk with the very God who had done all of that. And the people said, okay, we waited long enough. How quickly we forget. And Christian, it's not just the children of Israel that are guilty of that. How quickly we forget what God has done in our life. How quickly we deviate from what God wants for us in our walk or lack of walk for faith. And understand it was here that God is going to give the law to his people. God is going to reveal his word to them, how powerful, how precious, how marvelous God's revealing his law. And I'm going to give you some notes that we've already got to. We're going to get to the last bit uh, before we close here this morning. But number one, if you missed it, we see a glorious journey. A glorious journey. We see that in Exodus 31.8, and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. 
The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 34.10, And there arose not a prophet in, in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Christian, imagine if you, like Moses, got to go and commune with God and receive the word of God. And we go, wow. Man, I wish I could do that. Man, I, I wish I could, I could have what Moses had. Uh, Friday night, I got a text from Colton. And he was in a Chinese restaurant that I've been to once, wonderful place. And he sent me pictures of the food. And I said, I wish I was there. And to be fair, he did t tell me to turn around and come back and meet, meet him there. But I, I said, man, I wish I was there. I wish I was eating that. So often, we look in the Word of God and we see people like Moses who commune with God, who receive the Word of God, and we see, man, I wish I could do that. But Christian, we can do the very thing Moses did. We can fellowship with God. God made us uh, to have a relationship with Him, to talk with Him in prayer. God gives us His Word just as He gave to Moses. And we see here that uh, wonderful thing. We see a reunion, a glorious reunion, letter A, there in your notes. Uh, the glorious or the reunion here in uh, Exodus uh, 3 and verse 18. We see Moses and God together in Mount Sinai. Now, we don't know exactly, uh, but we do not know of another time since God spoke and called Moses that God had spoken with Moses face to face. They're back together. They're coming together here, Exodus 3, 4. And when the Lord saw uh, that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. God began to commune to commune with Moses there at the bush. And what a sweet return. Moses coming back to fellowship and communion with God. Very much like Bethel. Uh, and going back to Bethel for uh, the patriarch of the faith as he realized, I'm going to go back to that place where I talked with God, where I commune with God. And we see that reunion there in this passage uh, Moses went up, Deuteronomy 9, verses 9 through 11, tells us he went up to receive uh, that he was 40 days, 40 days in the wilderness or in the, on the mountain uh, to commune with God. By the way, it wasn't that he left and two hours later God's people said, okay, we're tired of waiting. He was gone 40 days. To be fair, that's a long time. But we don't decide God's timing. We follow God's timing. But Moses was there receiving from God, and in that uh, glorious uh, time there, there was letter B, the revelation of God. Let me define that word for you. Revelation is an act of God revealing truths that would otherwise not be known. Can I tell you, make a statement here that I, I know is true from the Word of God? many quote-unquote religious people would deny today because they don't agree with God or His Word. They want to be God. There is no new revelation from God. None. By the way, if you hear someone say, God revealed something to me that isn't in the Word of God, they're a liar. So, well, Pastor, you're talking about my mom or my brother or my, my favorite preacher. They're a liar. There is no, by the way, if you think you got a new revelation from God, you're lying to yourself. You're listening to the lie of the devil. There is no new revelation. We have all of God's revelation for us today. Everything right here. What happens is man wants to feel as though he is more important. And we say, you know what, I know something that Brother Gerald doesn't know. God told me something. He didn't tell you, but he told me because he loves me more than he loves you. Now that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? That's exactly what's happening in many false churches today. But oh, I, I got a word of knowledge. No, they got a word from the devil. The only word of knowledge available is God's word right here. And you understand God revealed his word to Moses. God reveals his word to you and to me. Now God doesn't speak to us uh, and give us tablets of stone. Why? Because he's given us all of his revealed word. But we have here Moses having the revelation or receiving the revelation of God's Word. I love the picture. It says that he wrote it with his own finger. Understand, it wasn't Moses' word. 
so often those who doubt the Word of God and those that question the legitimacy of God's Word will look at the Bible and say, okay, we're looking at Exodus, the words of Moses. No, it's the Word of God. Yes, God would give Moses to pen down the words that God gave him, but they're not the words of Moses. It's the Word of God. As God, with his own finger, the Bible tells us, wrote uh, the Word here, that revelation uh, of truth. 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but a holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God spake to his people before he revealed all of his word through the prophets. Those that God gave his word to give to his people. It wasn't the word of Moses, the word of God. Now I have all of the word of God. Number two, number two in your notes, Roman number number two. A grievous juncture. And we looked at this last week, but I want you to look at this passage again in uh, chapter 32 and verse 1. And when the people saw Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together upon, uh, unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. It goes on to tell us that they went to Aaron and said, Aaron, Make us a God. Here, take my earring uh, and uh, melt it down. You make it. You create it. Can I tell you the God he created? He didn't create a God. He made a God like unto the gods that were worshipped in Egypt. He had a vision. By the way, his vision of God had been skewed. It had been turned. I'll never forget Years and years ago, at a church uh, potluck dinner, probably, I don't even know how many years ago, for the very first time ever, I saw Filipino macaroni salad. How many of you have macaroni buku salad before? Miss Cheryl, I'm going to pick on her for a minute. I love her. I love her buku salad, by the way. And I looked at that. I grew up in the U.S., Macaroni salad, where I'm from, has mustard, onion, mayonnaise, pickle, salt, pepper, garlic. You know, that's, that's what's in macaroni salad. I looked at the macaroni salad, and I saw there was fruit in it. And I thought, Brother Mike, and fruit and mustard and onion and... No, I can't eat that. I had no idea. That's not what I thought it was. Why? Because my vision of macaroni salad, oh, that's, that's what's in there. When I found out what was in that salad and what it tasted like, I've tried to eat enough to make up for those years of not eating it ever since. Uh, but I had a preconceived notion of what I knew to be macaroni salad. Christian, can I tell you so often we look to the world and we get our preconceived notion of what God is and who God is. When Aaron built a God, made a God, his image of God had become Baal. He, he saw the false gods of the world. Let's be careful we don't get the wrong image of God. But we see here, uh, number one, or letter A, we see the impatience of the people. In verse 1, it tells us, hey, we're tired of waiting. We, we, we don't even know where this Moses man is. As for him, who knows? They said, Aaron, okay, you give us a God. We waited long enough for his God. His God isn't here. Give us another God. Let us follow our God. They were impatient. Uh, they, although they'd witnessed so many miracles. By the way, let, let, me, let me share a quote with you this morning. Waiting for God. Waiting for God is not laziness. Get that statement. Waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God, by the way, is not going to sleep. Uh, waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first activity under command. Second, it means readiness for any new command. It's waiting for God. It's doing what God's already commanded. Waiting for a new command. Uh, and thirdly, waiting for God is the ability to do nothing until the command is given. How many have ever tried to train a dog 
uh, to have a dog treat. You put it down and try to train the dog not to take it until you tell him to take it. You ever tried that before? How many of you have failed in trying to do that with your dog? How many of you, your dog is dumber than you and it's, it's a problem? Yeah, me too. And you know, like, wait, wait. I, I've seen people take uh, and put a dog treat on their dog's nose and tell the dog to wait and they'll balance that dog tree. And then when they say, okay, they'll grab that dog tree. My dog can't even balance it trying to eat it, man. My, I don't, my dog doesn't have those kind of superpowers. Uh, but you try to get him to wait. Christian, sometimes God wants us to wait. Sometimes God wants us just to trust him. God's people here struggled with that. They didn't want to wait on the Lord. They didn't want to wait on him. They doubted. They demanded their own way. They decided not to wait until Moses came down. They decided to take things into their own hands. They demanded Aaron that he made a God. Let us worship him. One thing that breaks my heart in this passage is when the people came to Aaron and said, Aaron, make us a God. There's no complaint of Aaron. There's not one mention of Aaron trying to talk them out of it. The next thing we have recorded in God's Word is Aaron says, Okay, uh, give me your earrings. That easily. That easily. There was no fight on Aaron's part. There, there was no integrity that held up against his God. Now, I believe God continued to work in Aaron's heart, of course, but there was a weak moment here where Aaron said, Okay, let's just do it. As he doubted. Let her be. The idolatry of the people. The idolatry or idol worship of the people. Verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. After he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron sold it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made the proclamation and said, Tomorrow was a feast of the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to pray. I'll share an illustration with you this morning. A little girl came home from Sunday school one day and she was asked the question what did you learn what did you learn in Sunday school today her father asked her she responded all I heard was that the children of Israel did this and the children of Israel did that and then she said didn't the grown-ups do anything? You know, the fact is, we see in verses 2 through 4 that God's people, the nation of Israel in the wilderness here, did a thing abominable unto God. They were in process of breaking one of the commandments God was even giving to Moses at that very moment of worshiping a golden calf. By the way, if you read the passage here, Aaron made the calf. After he made it, the people said, Hey, there's your God. And then Aaron said, We're going to have a feast to the Lord. Aaron basically said, That's the Lord now. That's Jehovah. That, that's what he looks like. That's our God. We're going to worship that calf. But he called him Lord. That's a scary slope as we see that idol worship of God's people. By the way, idol worship still goes on today. I know many of you probably don't have a, a little statue you worship, but so many times we have things, we have activities, uh, we have ideas that we give worship to before we give to God. God's people here began to worship a golden calf. 
2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Can I tell you, we see God here in the Bible who is a jealous God, who does not want to share, who does not want to share his worship with others. By the way, he has a right to expect us to worship him. You know, many people today misuse what God's given them. That which was meant to be used for God is lavished on self. We're going to talk about that this morning in a little while. We're going to talk about misplaced love this morning. And so often we see that in our culture, in our day and age today. Uh, we need to be and make sure that we stay free of idolatry. In our walk of faith, as believers, it's very easy to slip into idolatry. Idolatry is when I take anything that belongs to God and I give it or direct it where it doesn't belong, whether it's good or bad. Anything that is taken from God and goes somewhere else is idolatry. And it's very easy in my walk of faith to slip there where God's people did. And we need to be aware of that, understand that. Know that idolatry is not just me bowing down to some golden idol. It's also when I live for the flesh. It's also when I live for that uh, whatever it is that I makes my life, I feel the most happy than that. I give my life, I give my time, I give everything to that. I, I worship it. God is the one who deserves our worship, who earns our worship. Exodus 32, verse 17. Look there in your text, if you will. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. In verses 5 through 6, we see the people raising up, bringing sacrifices. We see the people as well uh, eating, drinking, loudly worshiping. By the way, they were proclaiming the worth of their God, but it was not to the true and the living God. Joshua said, hey, Moses, I, I think there's a battle. And Moses said, no. No, they're singing. It was not a song. It was not music that Joshua knew. Why? Because it was to the false god they had created. Exodus 32 verse 5 gives a record of Aaron's proclamation. We see that proclamation of a feast. It was a form of worship. By the way, it was organized religion as man saw it. By the way, any, any religion organized by man is false religion. Maybe I'll say that again so you get it. Any religion organized by man is false religion. By the way, understand we as believers are not part of a religion. I hope this morning uh, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And how wonderful that as believers in Christ we can come together and fellowship together in that relationship that we share. But we see a religion. We see false religion founded here by Aaron in the wilderness. Uh, Aaron's intention, I believe, was right. I, I believe Aaron was confused. I believe he, he wasn't quite sure. I believe he was on some shaky ground. I think he really thought he was doing right. He called it the Lord. But just because we are feeling like we're doing right does not mean what we do is right. Right is not defined by our feelings or our intention. Right is defined by he who is perfect and holy by God. And we see here that there was a falsehood. 
1 Corinthians 10, verse 21 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? Well, what a wonderful question for those today that are wrapped up in the worship of self and the worship of idols. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 15 says, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. I hope you understand this morning that God wants us to be separate unto Him. Last, uh, yesterday afternoon, I had the privilege of performing a marriage, marriage ceremony. And in that ceremony, that couple pledged to each other that they would keep themselves only unto each other. They would be joined together, forsaking all others. Our relationship with our God is a, should be a very similar picture. That we are separated from the world, from false religion, from idols, from everything else, from our assumed good works, from our religiosity, from our tradition, only unto Him. And we see that picture in Scripture over and over again. In Exodus 32, in verse 6, it says, And they rose up early in the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Understand here, we, under, we see God's people doing for this false God what should have been done for the true and the living God. God. There was a study done in February of 2007. Uh, it was released in 2007 uh, about American culture and narcissism. Five psychologists who were worried about the negative effect, and it is a negative effect, of self-absorption, which is our culture today, uh, that self-absorption is having on personal relationships in society at large examine the results of over 16,000 college students 16,000 college age young people and they noted a steady increase in scores that reflected an unhealthy an unhealthy disposition towards narcissistic behavior one of the doctors Dr. Twin said current technology fuels the increase in narcissism. By its very name, and mind you, this is from 2007, so bear, bear, let's understand the culture of these uh, words here. They're going to be antique, uh, antique technology to some of you. You may not know it. Uh, but by its very name, MySpace, how many of you remember MySpace a little while ago, uh, encourages attention seeking. By the way, we could change that to uh, uh, any social media platform we want today. Uh, but I'm reading uh, the text from this report in 2007, uh, as does YouTube. She even noted that volunteerism among young people can be self-serving and that it is needed for college applications and career advancement. Keith Campbell, the co-author of that same study, voiced concerns about relational fallout he said the study asserts that narcissists are more likely to have rom romantic relationships that are short-lived, at risk for infidelity, lack emotional warmth, and to exhibit game-playing, dishonesty, and over-controlling and violent behaviors. Twinge affirmed that narcissists tend to lack empathy, react aggressively to criticism, and favor self-promotion instead of helping others. Can I tell you that the children of Israel followed that same pattern? The same pattern that is not only apparent in a 2007 study in the United States among college age students, it is evident in our culture at large today. 
this idea of wrapping ourselves up in ourself. God's people in the wilderness, when they should have been on a journey of faith, had wrapped themselves up in themselves and what they wanted, what they desired, and it became all about them. I've got a, beside of my chair, my living room, I've got a container about this size, a little plastic container with lead on top. It's got peanut butter filled pretzels inside of it from Costco. Kirkland, how many have you ever had those? Kirkland peanut butter filled pretzels. Now, if I reach down beside of my chair and I grab that plastic container of peanut butter filled pretzels and I open the lid, no matter how silently I may try to open it, no matter how carefully I may try to keep from making noise, as soon as that lead makes the least little bit of noise, my dog could be in outer space somewhere. Uh, he could be on, you know, he could be all the way to Calgary. He, he could be asleep. He could be dead even and buried in the ground. Uh, he is raising from the dead if he hears that. Uh, he is running to where I am and his, his nose as close as he can get it to that container. You know why? He's like, hey, give me one of those. I want one of those. Now, he, he doesn't speak, Brother Mike. Uh, but if he could speak, that's what he'd be saying. He's like, you're opening that. I want to have one. When he was a puppy, I'd give him one. He was happy with that, Brother Eric. He got one. It was all good. He'd walk away. He doesn't walk away now. I give him one. I go to eat one. He's there again. He doesn't want me to have him. He wants it for himself. He's like, what are you doing eating, eating my stuff? I call them dog treats. Uh, someone come to the house and say, hey, you want a dog treat? And they look at me kind of funny. Uh, he believes they're his. He wants them. Christian, we mirror that in our lives, sadly, in our culture. Whatever it is. It's about us. It's about what we want, about what we can get. And we see that played out on the pages of Scripture here in Exodus 32. As God's people here decided they'll just do whatever they want. By the way, in the last part of verse 6, we see that they did more than just simply performing spiritual actions. It says that they rose up to play. And I won't go in depth into that, but that doesn't mean that they went to go play board games. It has very vile connotation of wickedness that they performed one with another, wickedness that they had learned in the worship of the false gods in Egypt. It wasn't that they just took that which was good and gave it to a false god but they espouse wickedness as well. And by the way, you always go down that slope. When you take that which belongs to God and give it to someone or something else, you always go the wrong direction. And we see that happening. 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. May we, as a church, always be a, as we gather together, a holy gathering of worship, not a playhouse. For immature believers but may we truly worship the Lord God's people were at a juncture at a crossroad they had a choice to make they made the wrong choice I ask you this morning and we'll close with this does your life does your life lean is it leaning away from God's purpose and waiting to find in your own way? How many have ever driven a vehicle that 
was badly out of alignment before. Anybody ever had that privilege before? You know, you take a vehicle and drive down the road and you let go of the steering wheel. It should kind of keep going straight. And I know many of you, you have, you know, steering assisted vehicles. This is my steering assist right here. But, uh, you know, if you don't have steering assist on, if you let go of the steering wheel, your car should go pretty well straight. I've driven vehicles before you let go of the steering wheel. The car almost goes off the road. I remember one vehicle I drove, you almost had to turn the wheel constantly because it was wanting to just walk off the road. It was so badly out of alignment. What direction is your life pulling? Are you pulling towards waiting on the Lord and trusting the Lord and faith in God, or are you getting impatient? Maybe you're getting impatient. Say, Pastor, I prayed. God didn't answer my prayer the way I wanted. Maybe say, Pastor, I, I'm just tired of waiting. I'm tired of waiting on an answer. I'm tired of this. I, I, want, I want something that satisfies me. I want what I want. By the way, that's the culture today. I want what I want, and God's going to have to just deal with it. No. No, you're going to have to deal with the result of disobeying a holy God. And we see here in, in Scripture that God's people were at a juncture. May we take inventory of our life. May we ask ourselves, am I walking by faith? Am I trusting God? Or am I telling God, hey, Lord, I'll take over for a while. If I need you again, I'll let you know. God's people were at a very dangerous juncture. And so often we come to that same place. Let's pray together. Lord, help us as believers to walk by faith. Lord, we are very often tempted to veer off course. We're very often tempted to give our worship where it does not belong. We're very often tempted to follow culture rather than the cross. We're tempted to follow the ideas of men rather than the Word of God. Lord, I pray you'd help us to wait on the Lord. Help us to be patient. Help us to walk by faith. Help us not to give that which belongs to you unto the world, unto the flesh, unto false idols and false religion. But God, may we be holy. May we be consecrated. May we be yielded to you. Lord, I pray you bless. Lord, be with us in our service to come. Uh, Lord, may you be glorified today. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll be dismissed. We'll start our services back here in about 18 minutes.